Welcome everyone. Uh, I think this is like our 28th Parents Connect session. It's probably like a seventh, but it feels like we've done a lot and it's starting to get like quite familiar and quite routine, which is lovely. Um, we've got two more planned. Um, this is, sorry, this one and another one planned. And so we'll give you an update of what happens after this one, but the two are actually connected. So tonight's one, we're talking about motherhood. Um, it, the title is The Joys and Challenges of Motherhood, but what we're probably going to talk about is the challenges um, and the joys are just assumed. Okay, so you don't, well, don't worry if we don't mention too many of the joys, just, just assume that they're there. Um, and then in a fortnight's time, we're going to be talking about the joys and the joys of fatherhood. Um, and we're going to have two guys uh, who are the creator and some of the directors of a group called Dad's Group. Um, which they've got like little plants all around Victoria and up in Sydney and Queensland. And they're just pretty much dads that meet together. Um, they've got like an online presence and they're going to actually talk to us a bit about fatherhood and some of the challenges that come with it. Um, yeah, but tonight we actually have the pleasure of listening to uh, Juliet and Anne and Cheryl. And I think between them, they have like 11 <laughs> kids. Is that correct? <laughs> all right. You have uh, 11 kids between yes. the three? Yeah. Well, well done. That is five times more than Rachel and I. So great effort, guys. Um, so yes, the theme of tonight, we're sort of just talking about the challenges, uh, the, the joys of motherhood. And what actually got the ball rolling is there's that mum's group online, which I am not allowed into for some reason. Um, but I think uh, Yin and Amanda run it and organize it. And at one point, they did like a bit of a poll on some of the challenges that comes with mothering. And uh, yeah, Yin was kind enough to share me some of the top topics, that, uh, some of the top votes that came through. Uh, and then people suggested that these three ladies would be really good to speak about them. So we're just going to speak through some of those top polls. Um, we're not going to cover everything. Um, but yeah, we're just going to sort of have a bit of a general chat. And we're here just to learn from each other and to listen to each other, um, which is really cool. So thank you guys for offering um, and allowing me to bend your arms to share. We're excited to hear from it. Um, but yeah, I guess we might as well just kick it off. Uh, Juliet was the most vocal on the WhatsApp chat. Um, so that means she's definitely the most prepared. Uh, so we might, we might start it off with Juliet. And one of the things that you mentioned was, it, it was something to do with, I guess, tiredness and fatigue, and I guess a bit of a workload that sort of comes with mothering. Um, could you maybe explain what that actually means to you and maybe also what it looks like in your life? Sure. Um, so I guess that if you don't know me, I've got three. Um, I've got a four and a half year old is my youngest and I've got an eight year old and a ten and a half year old. Um, and out of the poll, the, you know, there were a few sort of top topics that mums are struggling with. So I identified with fatigue and tiredness, but also... Um, resentment for imbalance in workload um, and something else that kind of and I just felt like they all kind of relate some of those negative feelings and stuff for me can come out of the tiredness or they're magnified when I'm extra tired so they're kind of interrelated if you know what I mean um, I thought I mean if you've heard this if you already know this you can chin out but it helped me to reflect on um on tiredness to start with by going well you know before you have a baby everyone tells you you're going to be tired because you're going to be sleep deprived so that's obvious and you're like okay sleep deprived but nobody told you about all the other aspects of tiredness and what makes you tired and it's not just sleep deprivation <laughs> so there's physical tiredness which is sleep deprivation but then there's, um, you know, the physical, like the feeding. So if you're actually breastfeeding, that is actually really tiring. And I'm saying this just maybe to help mums unpack why you're tired mm -hmm. and for dads to understand why we're not just tired due to just sleep deprivation. Yeah. So like feeding is really tiring. And so you constantly need to feed and hydrate yourself. Then there's lifting. No one tells you that your baby's going to get bigger and heavier. So every time you lift to feed, you lift to change a nappy, you lift to take them out of the nap, you lift them up because they're scared or they're tired or they're crying. You're doing weights like all day. So <laughs> your neck, your muscles, your shoulders, like 
is really tiring physically. And I think I wasn't prepared for that. So at the end of the day, you feel like you've done a workout and then you wonder why you're so tired. And you're like, it's just because I'm not getting enough sleep or I'm waking every couple of hours. But actually, I've done a workout today and every yeah. day. <laughs> and I um, found that like if the child has a choice to choose between grabbing onto mum's leg and grabbing onto dad's leg, at least from what I've seen and what I've experienced, it's mum's leg is the first option and mum's other leg is option B. Yeah. And, then, and then if all this fails, maybe the dad will get a chance. Yeah, yeah. And I do hear some exceptions where <laughs> dads are, you know, the favourite and mums are like, they always want dad. I'm like, it's just in the majority of experience, it usually is mum. And I think I've come to accept that that's just true. Like that is just fact because mums nurture the baby, you know, if, um, you're talking about the first few, few years of life, it's, it's nurturing. And then after that, into primary school, dads become super important. But in that first couple of years, like you just kind of have to accept the fact that mum is number one <laughs> for the child. Um, you just, you got to just kind of make peace with that and go, okay, this is my privilege for this couple of years before they start looking for daddy a bit more. Um, but the tiredness, I think also what you don't realise before having your babies is the emotional tiredness. So, you know, at the start, people joke about hormones and hormones are true, but you know, when your baby's crying and you know, you don't know why, like you want to cry too. <laughs> you know? And if you're trying to sleep train and you're outside the door waiting for three minutes or five minutes and they're crying, you want to cry as well. It's really emotional. So every choice that you make for your child is, you're constantly going, is this the right thing? Am I doing the right thing for my child? Um, and it's very, like, it's emotional, you know, and you're questioning yourself and stuff. So that there's that tiredness that you don't realise that you have all day while you're making decisions. And then there's, like, the mental load tiredness of thinking about what time did I feed? What time do we need to go down for a nap? If we're on solids, what time do I need to do solids between milk feeds, between naps? And you're on this constant routine of, feed, play, sleep, feed, play, sleep, and then feed, solids, play, sleep. I've got to go out, so I need to time my going out for this nap or whatever, and the feed, do I have enough? So there's this constant mental um, checklist and clock <laughs> going, and it just doesn't yeah. stop. Yeah. So there's this tiring mental load as well, and then you then have less time, like say, for deep spiritual stuff. So you're lacking in that area. And so I'm like, of course we're tired. Like there's, it's not just because I'm waking every few hours. I have a mental load and an emotional load, a physical load. And I think daddy doesn't quite understand that yet. And, um, and the thing is then I've got to verbalize it because he can't read my mind. Yeah. So as much as, you know, I think before you have children, you kind of, each, each, each partner works to each other's strengths and kind of complement each other that way. And then after you have children, the things that might not have annoyed you before suddenly become magnified because you're so tired <laughs> and you're so drained um, that that's where then it starts to become like, they should just know what to do or know what I need, but they, they actually can't read our minds. <laughs> I found that Rach has found me less and less funny with each kid. <laughs> and so I think w I'm afraid to go any further in case she finds me completely unfunny by the third or fourth. <laughs> no, yeah, that, that's true. Your serious face <laughs> is on more, I think, because <laughs> you're constantly thinking. Yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think maybe under helping, that helped me to understand why I'm so tired and where then um, Penin could help me in, because now I know there's all these different areas that um, contribute to my tiredness. Where can he help me hmm. to manage? Um, but if we don't talk about it, then he, he, if I don't talk about it, he won't know. And then I just get cross and he doesn't know why I'm cross. Yeah. So I've learned all the time that, you know, if I don't talk about it, it's my own fault because then I'm internalizing all these feelings and I'm playing all these negative stories in my head <laughs> instead of playing all the positive ones. We heard that in a talk recently. Um, mm. When I could just talk about it with him 
maybe not when I'm all worked up because it'll come out the wrong way and it becomes a you and me battle and he's on the defensive but maybe like an hour or two later when I calm down <laughs> and I can go so hey like did you notice that all the dishes are still on you know next to the sink and not in the dishwasher like if it's left there that means someone else had to do it which is me yeah. So, do you think you could help me out by just putting your stuff straight in the dishwasher <laughs> for yeah. example so uh, and i can say this about all the husbands because I, I know all of them like pinin is an incredible dad and a great uh, a great husband and same with robbie and same with charles um and so the, i guess the thing is there is still uh, maybe a disconnect of them understanding how tired you are or the fatigue, just like the physical, emotional, mental fatigue that comes with it. Mm. Is there things that we should probably be aware of as husbands and fathers, or is there things that we should be doing or maybe things that we shouldn't be doing or shouldn't be saying during this period that could probably help things out? Mm. I mean, I think the obvious one is, I mean, God forbid your husband, if you're home with the kids, that your husband says, you've been home all day. Like, what have you been doing? Like, that is probably the biggest no-no to say. Um, I think, I guess why I describe the tiredness is uh, we understand that dads are out at work. If you're at home as a mum, dads are out at work. And so they are working hard during the day. Um, and so mums are also obviously working hard in a different capacity. And, you know, when you have a baby, it's the first time you're ever a mum. Mm. And so you've been good at your job before, for, you know, presumably, and then now you have a role change. And women have many role changes. You know, your, your friend, your girlfriend, your wife, and then now your mother. Um, and so just understanding that we are trying to grapple with our new role as well and how to best do it. And we are constantly learning and um, we haven't got it down to perfection ever, maybe. And then when you have a second child, um, you think you kind of have worked out, maybe you've already gotten to a rhythm with the first one and um, you think, oh, yeah, we'll, you will just do this. But having the second child, now you're, it's the first time you've ever been a mother of a toddler and a newborn. And then it goes on. And then it's the first time you're ever the mother of a school child a toddler mm. and a newborn. And if you're Anne, it goes on for another five. <laughs> um, but it's constantly learning. So I guess they can't, dads kind of seem that we know always exactly what we're doing. And the, the best thing is just to ask for them to go, okay, um, is there anything I can do right now while you're doing this? And I think when we're married first, when we're married, you know five love, love languages, so I'm probably going all over the place, but That's we good. kind of know what our five love languages are. After you have children, I would say for most of the mums I've spoken to, it changes and the first one then becomes acts of service, probably, for most mums. So I could say my, my, my love language before, for example, was I think touch and quality time and stuff. After I've had a child, touch is not on my list at all. <laughs> the first one is access service um and and it, it's so easy for us to go into that you and me mode of um you know two individuals and opposing sides almost when you're very annoyed but i have to constantly remind myself that we're supposed to be a team mm. um and i think i think someone mentioned it last session you had but that team mentality and teamwork is really important because if I know that he thinks we're a team and we're in this together, that helps me. Um, it helps me just feel supported and yeah. to know that if I need something done, I can ask because he's willing to do it. And in our experience, um, I understand that men and women think differently. Like women are just created one way in the way we think and men are created another. And of course there's exceptions. Um, but we're more inclined to look, notice certain things or to be on top of certain things. And Penina's has just said to me a few times, because I keep forgetting, like, I'm happy to do it. Just tell me what to do or make a list and I'll work through that list. And my first reaction when he first said this was like, 
but I shouldn't have to tell you what to do. <laughs> you should just know what to do. And it should be completely obvious. And he's like, well, it's just not like, I just don't think that way. So if you want this to, if we're doing this and you need me to help, you just have to spell it out. And then once I made my peace with that, and of course I've had to go back and forth a bit, um, it helped a lot. <laughs> yeah, and it helped yeah. me to know that he had said, I'm happy to help. And I think half the battle is, is also, you know, if your husbands are willing to help, if your husbands are unwilling to help, that's another ball game, which I guess I'm not so experienced yeah. in. Send them over um, to me. I'll have, <laughs> I'll have words with them. Um, that's what, yeah, what you're saying about like being on the same team is really good. We, we touched on that a fortnight ago and we sort of talked about like, you know, when you get married, you get married to someone that you really like and you get married to someone that wants the best for you. And so if there are issues coming up, you have to remind yourself that they want what's good for you. And so there has to be probably some better communication happening to make sure that you're yeah. both on the same page again. Like you're not married yeah. to someone that's looking forward to causing you grief. You're married yeah. to someone that actually wants to see you win. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, just sometimes it's that extra bit of communication. Um, yeah. Hey, Julia, that's actually fantastic. Uh, Julia was like, oh, I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. And so far it's been <laughs> incredible. Um, <laughs> But something that you touched on was uh, you talked about like role changes as time goes on, your, your role change. And I think that sort of leads well into what Anne um, had uh, sent through. And that was something to do with like missing, I guess, the old relationship, like things sort of start to change. Um, yeah. And, you you know, yeah, you said you, you're a friend and then girlfriend and then, you know, fiance and wife. And then all of a sudden you're a mother and you're this and you're this. Um, and I guess, yeah, as, as you change your relationship changes and things get lost or yeah, you pick up new things. And I think, yeah, Anne, you'd sort of touched a bit on what that, what that feels like or what that looks like. Mm. Yeah. Um, and I guess you may find that there's a bit of a common theme amongst all of these issues that we're going to talk about. Cause um, I kind of really didn't want to go after Juliet cause she was so good, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah, sort of um, Juliet was talking about having that open communication between each other to sort of talk through so then you each know where each other's head is at um, regarding particular issues. And I guess in a very similar vein, um, it is about communication um, and it is about um, sort of, it's a mixture of communication giving time for that communication to happen, but also changing your goalposts a little bit as well. Um, so like for, uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, so I'm Anne, I have um, five kids and they vary in age from um, three through to nine. Um, and so when Robbie and I were going out and we were first married, we would actually play tennis together. That was our thing. Um, uh, we used to go on picnics, we'd um, have like these long three course meals and go for strolls around the Yarra, like just, you know, we, we had time um, to be able to do that and um, now we can't play tennis. Well, Robbie can, um, but both of us can't because uh, there's no one looking after the kids. Um, we do do picnics but it um it involves lugging around a lot more food yeah. a lot more entertainment um there's a lot less sitting down and a lot more running after and putting out spot fires and figuring out where each kid is and um so it's you know just slight slightly more stressful um in terms of going out for um picnics and we do occasionally still go out for dinner occasionally um just the two of us but we can't do it very often i mean like who's going to volunteer to babysit five kids on a regular basis um thanks for putting up your hand kyle i'll uh, keep that in mind <laughs> <laughs> um and and often when we do go out for dinner it's not a long one because you kind of feel bad that you've left the kids with the grandparents and so you just kind of like, you can enjoy your meal, but you're sort of trying to do it quickly. And um, it's, it's just not the same. Mm. Um, and I guess even then, when we have time to ourselves having dinner, 
probably about 75% of our conversations about the kids and about house and, um, and, and all of that sort of related stuff, um, as opposed to what we would talk about before, which, um, yeah, it was more about life and expectations and where we're at. Um, yeah, so, so nowadays, I guess it doesn't sound that romantic, um, but on the flip side of it um, is we have kind of changed our goalposts in terms of what we can do together um, as a couple. So, um, so now we do still have um, date nights, but it does look quite different where our date night consists of waiting until the kids all go to sleep and sometimes that can be a really long wait. Um, but we wait until they're all in bed and we actually sit down and we watched an episode of some TV show together. Yeah. You know, it's just something that we do together. Um, and that's mm. our thing now because that's kind of all that we can do. <laughs> um, but we enjoy it. It's something that we can <clears throat> enjoy together. Um, and what it also allows us as long as I have to admit, I kind of sometimes fall asleep or I'm really tired by the end of watching the TV show, but that also allows that opportunity to, if we needed to talk about stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said before, it is about giving that, that space and that time and that opportunity to be able to do that. Um, so then that kind of means that you're both on the same page um, yeah. Rather than like Juliet was saying, you know, this is you, this is me. Um, it's, yeah, it's sort of being able to turn into that team um, mm. a little bit more. Hey, Anne, um, I'm really liking what you're saying about like yeah, actually allowing the time for communication. Like lots of people say communication is the key. Like, you know, good expectations, good communication. But you're also saying good communication doesn't happen unless there's space for good communication yeah. to yeah. happen. And sometimes that can't happen at the flick of the switch. It needs yeah. a bit of time to come up. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's, I just wanted to make sure I sort of reiterate that because that's jumped out at me. Um, but you did say uh, a couple of times about moving the goalposts. Mm. And I'm wondering, is that something that just happens? And like you both sort of are like, oh, we both <clears throat> now understand things have changed and we both accept and understand what that means without having to discuss it. Or was this an actual, like, maybe conversation that needed to happen where one of you or both of you are like, hey, things have changed. We should talk about it. Um, yeah, I, for us, that kind of just happened organically um, because it was, yeah. Because <laughs> um, it, it started out with us sort of just enjoying a particular TV show. And with kids, you can't sit down and, um, you know, watch it as it goes live or mm. whatever <laughs> at the moment. So we'd watch it from um, from DVDs or from Netflix and things like that. And so, um, yeah, for, for us, like I said, it just sort of happened. It was something that we found easy to do. Um, and and because, bec because it was easy and because we enjoyed it, it was something that we just continued to do. Yeah. I mean, sometimes, it obviously, depending on how the week's gone or how the month's gone, um, <clears throat> we have to miss out on, on those particular things that we do together. But, um, yeah, generally speaking, we, we do make time for that. Mm. Mm. That's cool. And um, I guess, uh, how do I phrase this? Um, sort of yeah, tacking on with what Juliet has said and, and what you've said. So like Juliet has talked about like the emotional sort of load or I guess the, the fatigue the, that sort of builds up because of all the different areas um, that you sort of have to cover. Um, and then, yeah, you've spoken about like how, yeah, you know, activities become a little bit more stressful than enjoyable when you've got a whole family to cater towards. I guess probably sometimes it might come across that the husband really wants to do all this fun things uh, and the wife doesn't want to do all the fun things. Um, and it's almost like, Oh, fun person, not fun person. But I would dare say, like, if you just ask the question, you'd find out that the mum really wants to do all the fun things, but probably the toll that it takes might be a lot greater than the toll it takes on the dad. Yeah. I assume. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I guess, 
um, what I found to be quite helpful for us now, disclaimer, <laughs> I'm definitely not a professional at all in terms of all of this and in terms of parenting, um, but, but, and I'm really only just talking about our experience as a couple, but um, what I found to be quite useful was um, on days, because I would sometimes have days off um, during the week, um, and on some of those days, it would be kid free. Um, and so, uh -huh. and what, yeah, oh, amazing. Um, what Robbie would do is he would actually take a day off on a day where I was off and it was kid free and we could go and do stuff together. And I found that really, um, yeah, just so useful, um, and beneficial. And I guess as it just kind of demonstrated that, yes, we have kids. Yes, we're generally really bit, very busy with the kids and their schedule and kind of sorting out the house. But um, like, I still have eyes for you and for our relationship and I'm going to put time and effort into mm. being able to manage that mm. when I can. Um, so that's like, you know, a little tip for you, husband. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I hope I hope all the lads in here are listening up. Uh, I've got my pen and I've been scribbling away. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, I might Sorry, just... Anne, can I ask how often yeah. you do that? Sorry. No, how no, often? that's literally what I was about to say is like, does anyone have any questions? So perfect timing. Um, not crazy often. <laughs> um, and probably, you know, like... <laughs> Probably not as often as we would both like. I'd say maybe um, once a month, maybe once every few months um, that that would happen. Slightly different. I've, I've kind of lost a bit of perspective this year as well um, in terms of timing. Um, so, so I kind of can't really remember. Um, 2020 has gone for like three years already. <laughs> like, it's, yeah, it's been very different. Um, yeah, but sort of, I can kind of vaguely remember it being maybe once a month, once every two months. Yeah. And um, who would you, uh, who would be looking after your five kids? Yeah, name names. <laughs> <laughs> Give them, what numbers? What are the numbers? <laughs> um, so this would be on a particular day where either all the kids, like the kids were either all in school or in childcare. Um, or if it if we still had like a young one um, that wasn't yet in childcare, it would be um, my mother-in-law. Amazing, but yeah. No, it's really good. Um, yeah, I do want to sort of open up the floor. Um, if anyone sort of has uh, a comment or a question that they would like to ask, we we've got more things that we're going to cover. But yeah, um, anyone have anything that they'd like to ask at the moment? That is all good. Um, and I think it's really nice that a lot of these topics are bleeding into each other a little bit. Um, and I saw, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I did see Cheryl and Charles laughing a whole lot when we talked about like the fun parent and the, the not fun parent. I'm not the fun parent. I'm assuming Cheryl's the fun parent and Charles is the not fun parent. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, Anne was sort of talking about, I guess, the importance of like, I guess, like the husband being reminded that like the wife has eyes for him that they they enjoy their relationship still but i think i guess that often also requires like to actually set aside time to make sure that your relationship is actually like being fostered and grown and nurtured and i think cheryl you might have something to talk about like uh, setting aside time to actually have with each other the importance of that well, like I didn't really want to participate initially because Carl asked me just after Charles and I had come back from leaving the kids for four nights. <laughs> and, and, and I was like, motherhood? I don't think I'm qualified to talk about motherhood. And Carl uh, was like, I think you're everyone obviously in this very group. good at time thing with your husband. <laughs> now, everyone in this group wants to just hear what it's like to have four days away. <laughs> <laughs> just tell us what the days look like. <laughs> Did Oli say to you that it was even sweeter when they announced the restrictions the day after we came home? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <clears throat> well, I mean, 
I, I guess, yeah, Charles and I are, are probably quite good at making time for each other. It's like, I think we are very aware of what we need as individuals, um, which is sleep, and what we need with each other, which is quality time. Mm. And so, because I guess we look at every, we just look long-term for everything. We just knew that our kids had to sleep so that we could sleep and we could spend time together. And we kind of also, I mean, this, was, this is how we practically work things out for our family. And we were like, and if we sleep train our kids, then we can send them over to the grandparents for sleepovers and they'll be happy to take them because all you got to do is put them in your cot and walk away. And there's like <laughs> no reason why you wouldn't want a kid like that in your room. <laughs> um, so like we joke about it, but actually like um, these were like just important steps to um, ensuring that we have time together. But I guess, you know, speaking about quality time, it's kind of funny, right? Because we always, yeah, we do sleepovers. We make sure we have holidays. Um, and you know what? Every time it rolls around, I feel guilty. Like I, I almost want to cancel. Like every single time, um, and every single time, Charles is like, "Don't you even dare!" And he, because he's the less emotional, less like guilt, guilty person, um, he makes sure it happens. Um, and it's wonderful when we do it. But I never feel like it, like until we, until we get there. And even like when we were away. There was one day where all we'd done was like have a massage and, and go for a wine tasting. And I was like, Charles, I'm exhausted. Like, I can't, can't go out for dinner. He's like, I'm so up. Cheryl, like, come on. It's okay. It's not like we did anything today. Um, that sounds but... really, really tough. We'll be, we'll be probably, after this meeting's over, some of us will join another group and we'll pray for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, like, I, I, I guess I was just thinking, it's, you know, sometimes you want something right, and then when it comes, you don't even enjoy it because you feel guilty. And mm. I always remember, I had this patient, right? She was like, I'm going on a six week tour to Europe. It's gonna be amazing. And I saw her like eight weeks later and I was like, how was it? And then she started crying. She's like, you know, my 18 year old daughter missed me so much. It was terrible. All I could think about was, and you know, in that moment, I was like, oh crap. <laughs> I was like, it's it's never going to look the same. You know, like the things that I used to think we would look forward to, actually it's, it's not going to look the same. So I guess one part is making sure that you make time for each other. And yeah, Charles and I have both like throughout the year, we've taken days off sometimes just to spend time with each other. So we don't have to ask our parents to look after the kids. So like we've taken off days when the kids have childcare in school. Um, but um, another thing is like just realizing, Oh, like, Spend time as a family sometimes when we're both engaged. That, that's, that's really quality time. Um, mm. And just, yeah, like you said, changing the goalposts, right? Like it looks different, but it doesn't mean it looks any, like it's better. Um, so, yeah, I think, I don't know. There's a very clear family hierarchy in our family. Like our kids are like, they know that mommy and daddy need time together. <laughs> like, like, I mean, it sounds lame, but like, our kids know that we love each other and we need to love one another and we love our children, but that is an expression of our love. Like we try to teach them, you know, mom and daddy talking, don't interrupt us. You know, we want them to grow up and know that, you know, like when, when married couples are together, that they are each other's priority. Mm -hmm. um, and so. It's not quite mummy guilt, but it probably is a guilt that mums feel more than dads. So it's not quite the whole mummy guilt in terms of say comparison. But you're sort of talking about how, uh, like, when you're separated from your kids, it, it probably hits you. And I was even just talking with Rach the other day, and she mentioned something about, like, oh, when she goes to work, she misses them. Oh, well, at the time, it was just Walt. Like, when she goes to work, she misses Walt. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, he'll be, he'll be at home when I, when I get back home. That's all I need to know. Like, <laughs> uh, I'm not missing him while I'm at work. I'm, I'm focusing. My mind is at work. And I feel like that's a pretty common thread. I'm not sure if the other mums here agree, but I think maybe obviously there's a pretty innate connection between mums that makes the, the, the separation a lot harder. How do you guys, this is a bit off topic, but like, yeah, how do you guys deal with that, that you're really connected emotionally and physically to your kids in a way that your husbands aren't at times? Yeah, I just, um, I'll just say that can be a real point of um, tension and aggravation 
in some relationships, I think. And I think I, I might have said it before, it's, um, there's a lot to do with accepting, I think a lot to do with accepting how God made us, mm. <laughs> that women just function that way. And I can't be cross at my husband unless he's deliberately, you know, trying to <laughs> be disconnected. Um, but I know he, he misses them also when he's away, just not as much as me. But I can't be cross at him because that is actually the way that he's wired. And the sooner I can accept that, sometimes I reject it and I get really cross, but the sooner I can remain in that place of acceptance, um, it, it bears much better for our relationship. And I don't look at him and go, how come we can just go away so easily so many times a year and you tell me that i can go away and he's happy he's truly happy to be able to go away and do things but i just can't <laughs> and in the end maybe i just don't want to unless he actually makes me go like yeah. cheryl said um but that acceptance of the reality of how men and women and mums and dads function differently mm. has all is half the battle with how I then relate to him on that, in that area. <laughs> and even just harnessing that, you know, like, like because Charles is cold and I'm in black, <laughs> no, he's not cold, <laughs> but because he doesn't feel that guilt, you know, he can enforce, hey, let's, you know, send the kids to the grandparents, so we'll have a great time, we'll spend some time together. So he can override my emotionalness mm. in that, but then I can use my, you know, tenderness when I see him, you know, disciplining them in a way that I, I disagree with and say, well, no, please understand, you know, but it's, so it's, it's, yeah, it, yeah. Like utilizing those different, and, and I guess in some ways they both are strengths um, mm. and, and utilizing them to the, so you guys can, yeah, be the best of each other. Yeah. yeah. And I think maybe to add to that, and again, I'm just drawing on my experience as an observer of my wife, as opposed to an actual mother myself, um, is I think also the added stress of the likelihood of the mums thinking of everything that needs to happen before they can actually remove themselves from the picture. Um, like even with baby Hazel, like she has all these checkups that are in our eye calendar, which I don't know who put them in there, but I didn't put them in there. Like someone's been putting these appointments and these checkups in the eye cal and it's not me. So it's either Walt or Rachel is, you know, organizing these checkups and like, you know, baby Hazel has started solid foods. Um, and I'm like, oh, who are, yeah, she's getting that old. Hey, <laughs> but I'm like, who, who organized that? Who, who, bought, who bought this rice water stuff for this kid? Like who, who's doing all this work? And so I think there's probably underneath it, there's probably like a, a little bit of, the mums probably understand all the work that's going to be required for them to actually separate for a while because they've been doing most of the work a lot of the time, just generally. Uh, and then there probably also might be secretly just a little bit of a trust issue of <laughs> allowing someone else to do your job for a little bit because that's your job. You know, I do it really well. I've got everything running the way I want it to run. But yeah. That's yeah. Uh, an outsider's two cents. Um, Oh, by the way, does anyone have any questions and or comments at this time? Because I find it's fascinating. So I just, um, to throw back to what Anne and Cheryl were saying about time to ourselves. Yeah. I think you're talking about more couple time, but um, it's really nice when like Kanin gives me time and he takes the kids, like all three of them, and he takes them out for an hour or two hours or a whole morning at the zoo or something. Um, and he intentionally gives me time and it's not that we have give each other credits because sometimes it does feel like that because mm. it seems that the men get lots more credits, but switching off that mentality, um, because I know he likes to give me time as well. Mm. Um, so if dads can take them to the park for an hour or somewhere, for, I mean, now you can't, it's COVID, yeah. <laughs> but um, it's really nice and it does a lot, I think, for the relationship, for the marriage relationship to demonstrate that care um, and that intentional giving your partner some time. And then you also feel better when your husband says, oh, I'm just, I need to do this, I want to go here for a couple of hours. You're like, yeah, you know, without holding a grudge. 
mm. kind of thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think I, I, a lot of this I'm hearing is that there's probably some really simple things that dads would probably be really willing to do if they took the initiative, or at least if they're reminded that that is a really good thing to do. Because um, I'll say that sometimes I'll be a little afraid to break the cycle of whatever is happening. Like I don't want to break the routine. I don't want to disturb the order. But I think it sounds like sometimes dad al dads also need to maybe poke their heads in and actually be a bit more intentional and invite themselves into a space uh, and actually, yeah, be a dad um, sometimes. It's true because I think a lot of women, generally, if someone, well, often if a man asks like, oh, do you need help with, it's very easy to go, oh, I'll just do it myself. I'll just mm. do it myself. But it's very different when, when the husband steps and says, I'm going to do this, mm. FYI, and just yeah. does it. And it also just takes the, like, I think part of that mental fatigue that Juliet was talking about before is the decision making. Should I do this? Do I need to do this? And you might not even have done a single thing yet, but just thinking about all the things like you were saying, Carl, you know, the things that you have to do. And so when someone throws another question in, it doesn't matter what the question is. It's like, oh, like I'm already juggling. Like I can't, I just, I just don't just throw that ball back. Like just take your ball back. Like I don't want it. Like, even though it was a nice gesture or a nice thought. So, um, yeah, it's nice sometimes when um, I think, yeah, dads just step in and go, this is what's happening, you know, just letting you know, like, yeah. Yeah, 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 I feel you. But then sometimes we step in and it's not appreciated. <laughs> like, apparently Hazel is not old enough to be thrown up in the air. I'm like, <laughs> who made that rule? I don't know. <laughs> Kids these days, hey? <laughs> um one of the one of the um, uh, topics that came up pretty highly on the survey was this idea of feeling unappreciated, and it probably goes along to the the perceived or probably real difference in workload as well, um, especially like around the home and with these kids. But this idea of feeling unappreciated, um, and I think maybe Juliet, uh, we'd sort of tagged you to chat about it. But I'm really happy for any of the the women to mention and talk about it. But I guess probably my direction that I'd like to come from is maybe what are some things that lead to you feeling unappreciated? And it doesn't mean that it has to be your husband that you're talking about. It can be things that you've seen in other relationships. So we're not gonna like slam your husbands if you name things. But yeah, like maybe what are some things that lead to you feeling unappreciated with the knowledge that you you all have wonderful husbands who want to be good husbands, but there are still times when you feel unappreciated. So what leads to that? And then maybe on the other side is like, what are some steps that husbands could actually actively take to actually show, show the appreciation in a way that you'd receive it? Hmm. How can we help you if you won't help us help you? <laughs> um, I think, I think for me, what I have um, recognised is that that general feeling of being underappreciated um, mainly occurs when I'm really tired, um, and you just feel like I'm always the one that has to do this, mm. um, and it just yeah, it just gets. Um, I guess it comes to the surface a lot easier and um, when I am tired because I have less of that reserve to be able to put my energy into doing a particular task that perhaps I, I generally do every day of the week. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, because I'm tired and I'm like, oh, why do I always have to do this? That's when it kind of bubbles yeah. over. Yeah. Um, and in terms of, in terms of how to counter that, um, I have to admit, sometimes it just comes out and I'm like, ah, and even the kids have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and gosh, that makes them become angels when that happens, when they just see you lose crap and they just go, oh, she's really angry, better be on her best behavior. <laughs> um, so in a way it kind of works, but, um. But I think also um, what I have, well, 
should try to do a lot more, but, um, but what I find to be um, a little bit more um, productive um, is just when I'm really tired and I just don't want to do it, I will ask Robbie to do it. And it'll get done. It may not get done straight away. And, I, and I've had to make my peace with that as well, that, you know, he's not just going to go and jump at it and do it straight away. Um, but at least I know that if I've asked him to do it, then generally speaking, it will get done. Um, mm. So then I don't need to deal with all of that anger that gen like often what will happen is, you know, I'm unpacking the dishwasher or I'm stacking the dishwasher and I'm just churning through all of those angry, negative kind of thoughts. And so, you know, as each plate goes in, it gets harder and harder and louder and louder. Like, so mm. instead of having that, um, just by verbalizing it and saying, Hey, can you do this? Then it, it'll get done. And then you don't have to go through um, taking all of that emotional energy um, mm. into being internally angry um, while you're doing a particular task and feeling unappreciated that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. Like, you know, verbal appreciation is good, and but um, practically doing it helps Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> um, verbal appreciation as far as like as I said before you know first time that we're mothering at every stage different stages um, it's just to hear you know you're doing a good job or um, you know that was a really good meal or to the kids sometimes like you know say oh thanks for cooking mummy you know make sure um, wasn't that a, you know wasn't that yummy or um, I don't know thanks for putting my clothes in the wash because you left them on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. I, Rach, um, uh, Rach and I share the, the, the clothes washing loads. Oh, no, Rach, turn off your, turn off your thing. You're not allowed to be a part of this. <laughs> Rach and I share the washing load, not relatively evenly, like I'll admit Rach does more than I do, but we both do clothes washing. But just in the last probably two days, Rachel has started to make like a literal laundry list of all the things she's no longer accepting. Like <laughs> if your t-shirt or if your jumper is half inside out and half in, uh, half outside <laughs> in, I don't want to do this. If the things are next to the thing and not actually in the thing, that doesn't accept. Can you start unballing your socks, uh, socks because yes! they don't drive yes! properly? Like oh, all of a sudden, God. out of... Out of nowhere, we've been married for 13 years, and then, like, all of a sudden, it turns out we've been really wrong. Before this Hazel, time. I had time to unball your socks when I was hanging them out. <laughs> and I had time to untangle your jumpers and stuff. But now it's yours, plus Walter's. <laughs> yeah. and all the like, why can't you just take off your jumper symmetrically? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Rachel. We had the conversation, Rachel. We I had the conversation with Pin. I was like, "Why are the socks always like inside out?" Or yeah, because I take them off and they're the right way out. And he's like, "Well, because isn't it the inside that needs to be washed more?" Oh. <laughs> yeah. like, All right. Okay. Well, the guy. Well, see, the inside, the inside out, out thing doesn't bother me. You can inside out them yourself because I'm not going to put them back the other way. <laughs> no. I don't mind if they're inside out. It's just when they're like curled oh, up in these tiny little balls i'm like they're not gonna dry <laughs> and i have to like individually pull them all apart yeah i'll, I'll tell <laughs> you why I've, i'll tell you why my socks are balled up is because i found a really efficient method for removing my socks <laughs> and it doesn't frustrate anyone else in the house which is to <laughs> slam my foot down really hard and then just slide it backwards and my sock like peels off <laughs> So you can just stand up and move your foot with a bit of force and your sock peels off because I wear like ankle socks, but that means they're in balls. It's so weird. <laughs> uh, right, I'm editing this. I know, right? I'm editing this part out. Yeah, uh, maybe Cheryl, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but did you want to maybe speak to any of that uh, idea of like unappreciated and maybe things that lead to it and maybe things that husbands and fathers can do to uh, work with that feeling of being unappreciated? I mean, uh, to be honest, I, those sort of feelings for me, they rear up when I'm tired yeah. or when I'm hormonal. Really PMS is a, 
it's a bit of a catchphrase in our house. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but, but we learned this new technique last night. I, I came downstairs after putting the kids to bed and I was like, I, I just could feel it. You know that rumbling in your gut <laughs> where you're like, oh, I just, just felt like I had it in for Charles. And so Charles is uh, like, he's a fixer. You know, so I came into the room and I just like, I had my phone, like I just wanted to switch off. So I had my phone in front of me, which I don't normally do. You see, I talk to him um, and he was like, so you okay? And I was like, hmm. And he's like, okay. And usually he would be like, are you sure? Do you want to talk about it? What's the problem? We need to chat. Are you mad at me? By which time I'm like, yes, I'm mad, I'm mad at you now, you know, because you kept on asking me. And then I just fell asleep. It was like eight o'clock and I just fell asleep. And I woke up and I was like, hey, we didn't fight. <laughs> and you know what? There was nothing to fight about. I was just really, really tired. And I was just in a mood because I was really, really tired. And I was like, I'm so happy you didn't ask me if I was okay more than once. And then we would have fought. <laughs> but it's, I, I think one thing is for Charles and I, because he wants to make everything right. And I had to teach him, like, sometimes making everything right is actually not saying anything until I've had a sleep. That's mm. it. It's yeah. as simple as that. You know, like, don't take it personally if I'm in a bad mood, because it isn't necessarily about you. I just need a bit of rest. <laughs> so. Yeah. yeah. So I'm hearing, like, Anne say, like, leaving space for good communication. And then I'm also hearing Cheryl say that also the timing of that communication <laughs> is also really important. Like, oh boy, <laughs> better write this down. <laughs> Space and timing. Okay. <laughs> ah, I wasn't very good at algebra at school, but I'm like, I'm going to put all these pieces together. Yeah. And also that sometimes communication is not good because yeah. for me, it's like, I, I want to talk about it. Uh, mm. I want to fix it. I want to resolve it. But in that situation, I learned that I just need to turn around get on my phone and browse. <laughs> Please, <laughs> yeah. just watch some Netflix, just don't yeah. talk to me. And I'm like, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. No, that's good. I'm, I'm learning, yeah. Actually, no, maybe one, one thing, um, I don't know, it might be helpful, just thought of it, um, is if you, um, if when you're coming home from work, I guess as a dad, you're tired and you've just worked a whole day, and typically the joke is, you know, the dad was having working all day and mum's like, well, I've been working all day too. Um, when you come in the door, you're kind of like, what am I going to be facing? What's going to be happening in the house? Are there tantrums? Is it peaceful? Am I going to be ready? And like mentally, dads might also be unprepared for that or feeling the pressure of walking into whatever situation is in the house and having to jump in and handle. Um, and in used to drive, come home and sit in the driveway and I'd hear his car and then he'd, he wouldn't come in the house for like 15 minutes, 20 minutes and I'm cooking and I'm, the three kids are going crazy and I'm like, I know he's home, like, where is he? <laughs> he's and crying in the car. Ask, <laughs> yeah, he's just like, whoa. Like, Pastor Chi yelled at me again. <laughs> <laughs> What, what you're doing, what your intentions are, what you need, so that I understand when you're needing that extra few minutes. Because he said, what I'm doing is I'm debriefing myself. Because on the way home from church or whatever, you know, maybe it's not enough time unless you have a long journey. Debriefing myself so that then I can transfer from my daily work into just dad mode. Mm. Um, so that when I walk in the door, I'm ready um, to jump on board so that we can be the team again because you've been I've been doing this all day he's been doing this all day when he comes home all the wives when your dad comes home your husband <laughs> the wives are like yay because then you get to share the work you get to share but you get to share as a team and so he debriefs himself for 10 or 15 minutes if it's longer than that I'm like okay maybe he's on a work call or whatever but I know I've heard the car I just wait for him to come in you know, or if he's coming straight away and he goes, just, just give me 10 minutes and I'll be, I'll be there. It's better. Like I can't get, um, he will be a better dad. Mm. Having me having given him that time to get ready and change hats, um, and come on board. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's been helpful, but it was more helpful when he explained to me what he was doing 
rather than me going into the garage and going, what are you doing? You're home. You're like, can you come in yeah. <laughs> and help me? <laughs> yeah. Mm. That's really good. Like I, I, I've got a friend, um, uh, uh, he's a doctor, his name is Jeremy, a fantastic guy. And he's got like three kids or so now. And I remember talking to his wife um, and his wife was just like, he is just the best dad. Like as soon as he comes home, he's like instantly in dad mode for a, like as long as the kids need. Like his, his brain isn't anywhere else, but like he's prepared himself just as he's about to walk in the door. And she talked about like, I guess the, the freedom that that gave her. Cause she's like, I still don't have to be full on mum mode, even though another adult is in the room. I've got this person who's like, no, nah, I'm coming into the home with the, with the understanding that I'm going to be 100% dad in this moment. I can't be just the shadow in the room. That's like, Oh yeah, don't talk to me. Don't talk to me just yet. I need to do my thing. But yeah, she talked about like, I guess that liberation, that freedom of knowing that when her husband came home, he was like intentionally going straight into dad mode with their kids, even though, you know, whatever day he might've had at work, like in this space, he needs to really like, I guess, um, like fulfill his duty as a dad and, and, and carry his own weight, that type of thing. So, yeah. Um, it is almost 10 past nine. And so I do, I know that's not a whole lot of time in case anyone has questions. I apologize that I did that intentionally. Um, but yeah, if anyone has like something that they want to maybe expand it on or just a comment to sort of be like, yep, we feel the same way, that sort of thing. I'd love to give you a little bit of time and space to do that now. Yeah. And yeah, don't be shy. Um, I might just quickly jump in there and mm. um, kind of tagging onto that whole like, mum guilt that we touched on a little bit um i have found that um often you kind of extrapolating from leaving the kids and going off and doing stuff as a couple um i have found that um i would even feel guilty um about leaving them to go off and do my own thing mm. um and sort of going oh but there's so much stuff that needs to be done for them um you know why am i taking that time to go and do my stuff i'm just gonna organize stuff for them and forget about time for me yeah. um but like i have over a period of time um come to the realization that um i need to make time for myself mm. in a similar way that like you know Penny needed to have that time to sort of empty his mind and his, his head about work and then be able to jump in and, and be in dad mode. Um, that, that's something that all mums need to do as well. And you kind of just need to figure out what exactly that means for you. Mm. Like whether it is going out and um, like for, for me, I've, I've found that um, exercising helps me. It helps me get rid of stress and debrief from work, but then also it um yeah it also allows me to debrief and de-stress from from being around the kids um you know for for other people it may be going out and grabbing a coffee by yourself not with the kids and having to wrangle them all and think that you'll have me time by doing that mm -hmm. um but going out and having coffee sitting down somewhere and just enjoying your coffee hot like that that's just amazing um, but it is, it's sort of just, just kind of recognizing that you need to make time for yourself. So then you are more energized to be the, the mum that you want to be, yeah. um, to, to be able to have that headspace, to be able to deal with anything that the kids in the house and husband and dog and whoever else is around is going to throw at you. Mm. Um, you just need to have that space, um, to be able to empty your mind and yeah. re-energize. Yeah. That's really good. I might uh, do a bit of a, a summary of some of the things that we heard tonight, but I, I do want to sort of reiterate that um, I know when we do parenting sessions and parenting courses and things like that, I think the, maybe not the assumption, but the unspoken uh, assumption will be that it's probably going to be mums who are going to be most of the target audience. Um, and we're really hoping that tonight um, 
even if, even if the dads weren't able to join in and weren't able to make it, uh, that we will load this up online and it'd be really good if you wanted to share it with your, your husbands or the father of your children. Um, and yeah, and give them a chance to sort of like ruminate and hear about these things. Um, because it sounds like it's probably a stuff that lots of mums feel in, in different ways and variations of it. But yeah, even like what Anne was saying just then, like, you know, having time just by herself, um, that requires, you know, Robbie to actually be intentional about allowing and maybe even sometimes forcing Anne to be like, no, you need to go do this. Like you need to go uh, and be by yourself right now because it's good for all of us for you to be better. You know, like it's, it's all of us win when you're feeling better or, um, you know, or like, hey, we don't need to have this discussion right now with like, you know, Charles and Cheryl, like right now, actually it was really good for you to scroll Instagram for a while, um, you know, look at Pinterest stuff and then fall asleep on the couch and snore quietly while I, you know, watch, you know, stuff on Netflix. That's actually good for us right now, but that also requires husbands and dads to understand that sort of stuff. And so, yeah, like Juliet's been talking about um, the, the fatigue that comes with being a mother and sort of hit a lot of really interesting points about like, you know, uh, feeding is even though you know you can't really move around while you're feeding you're sort of sedentary and sitting there feeding life is literally draining out of you while you're feeding and that you know causes physical fatigue besides the fact that you're also often carrying your kid all the time and your kids are clinging onto you all the time and then uh, then there's like the mental fatigue and the emotional fatigue and just like you know the broken night sleeps and all that sort of builds up into like just a general full body fatigue and that's something that we dads need to be quite aware of uh, and also like right really considerate of as well when we like approach them and have demands and expectations and all that sort of stuff um and then i think a really important thing that juliet said was like the role changes um of like different stages of life you are now a different not a different person but you're the same person in a different role and that takes a while to adjust to like you know even and has five kids but like she didn't have five kids until she had her fifth kid you know she was a mum of you know one and then a mum of you know four and then a mum of five and then a mum of you know like you don't have five kids worth of experience until you have five kids and so that's a role change just as much as having no kids and then having a kid is a role change as well um and so that's probably really important to think of and i think uh, juliet said like sometimes the mums just don't know like it, it sounds like we, you guys have it all sorted um, because you do most of the organization and most of the heavy lifting, but quite often, a lot of the times you just don't know, you know, and you're just doing the best you can. And so that's really important uh, for the men to hear. And then Anne uh, talked a bit about like the communication and uh, along with what Cheryl said, I think that's really important is it's not just communication, but the space for good communication to occur. And then also, the timing of when that good communication should occur, like being discerning and probably emotionally intelligent enough to understand that there is a time and a space for communication to happen. And there's probably also a time and a space where Rach has heard enough of my voice um, and doesn't need to hear any more of my voice. And the conversation she wants to hear is no talking from me. Um, I've been perfecting this cool party trick where I, I like to sing just out of key because I think Walter finds it really funny, but it means we have music playing in our house all the time and I sing along to everything. But my funny thing is now I just sing along slightly out of key to everything. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, maybe if I was a bit more discerning, I would understand that Rich doesn't need to hear my voice sometimes, you know, the time and space sort of thing. <laughs> um, and also, uh, yeah, and you mentioned that uh, moving the goalposts, uh, which is really, I think, really important. You can't have the same expectations on each other when the demands on each other are different, like the outside demands on each other are different, which is really, really cool. Um, and something that all three of you have said is sleep is really important. Uh, <laughs> you all said it in different ways and all in the same way as well, but sleep is really, really, really important. Um, and so I think, yeah, again, we need to be mindful of that because you can't sleep if you're looking after a child. So that means sometimes maybe someone else needs to forcibly step in and look after that child for a while while a nap has happened or a sleep takes place. And um, yeah, Cheryl, you talked about how uh, yeah, 
actually being quite aware of each other's needs when you're talking about uh, making your relationship with each other quite important requires you guys to be a, an understanding of each other's needs. And I really liked what you said about like, sometimes that requires long-term planning in terms of your parenting. It's like, we will probably have to do a lot of hard work now to be able to reap the rewards later because that's what we're going to need. You know, we're going to need sleep. So we're going to have to put in a lot of hard work now to try and sleep train our kids so that we can have sleep later, which makes us better parents, better partners, that sort of thing. Um, uh, and also, yeah, I think something you, you said, which I probably haven't really uh, clicked on before is like quality time when you're both engaged with the kids is quality time with each other. Um, I think that's really cool because quality time, I guess, is sort of always assumed that it, it's you two off by yourself doing something. But quality time with each other when you're both fully engaged with the kids is quality time together. I think that's actually really important to sort of remember and know because you can always sort of view time where you're engaged with the kids as sort of like a, um, a buffer to good quality time with each other. So, yeah, that, that's really cool. Um, I do want to say a massive thank you to yeah, Juliet and, and Cheryl for... Uh, wholeheartedly agreeing to come and speak from the very first time I asked. They were practically banging down the door to let me let them speak. Um, and so I, I wanna thank you guys so, so much. It's been really good uh, for me to hear and I'm sure for everyone else to hear. Um, I do yeah, also wanna say that uh, this video will be loaded up onto our, like our Facebook page and it'll be up on YouTube for you guys to um, have a look at. But if you are here and your husband or your baby daddy um, isn't able to uh, watch it at the time when you watch it, please make sure that you sort of pass it on to them because I think it's really valuable stuff for the husbands and dads to know. And in saying that, in a fortnight's time, um, we are going to be doing what might be our last Parent Connect session for this little season. Um, we've got some more stuff in the works, but for this little season, we're going to take a pause. Um, is uh, We've got uh, Tom and Joshua Docking, who are some of the guys that have uh, started a group called Dad's Group, uh, which is yeah, a, a, a Dad's Group that meets together and they just talk about, I guess, some of the challenges that comes with being a dad. Um, and I think a lot of dads would struggle with a lot of similar things. It just probably doesn't get spoken about. And so these guys have formed like some really good groups. Um, they're located all through Melbourne and Sydney and Queensland. And so they're going to just uh, chat with us about, uh, yeah, some of the challenges that come with being a dad. And again, that one, we're hoping that a lot of the mums will join in and have a listen to that as well. Um, because, yeah, I, I could list all the challenges of being a, on a dad a, on, on a finger. You know, it's really tough. Um, uh, oh, I'm sure there's <laughs> challenges. I can't think of any right now. So I, I should, there are challenges with being a dad. I will think of them and I'll get back to you. Because Rachel is the best mother that you know. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel is the best mother that I know. Uh, but an even better wife. Uh, now, yeah, again, massive thank you guys. I uh, appreciate your time uh, thinking about it beforehand and, and being willing to share. And yeah. Uh, for the rest of us that listened in, please do feel free to message them and just give them a thanks for sharing because I'm sure it's been valuable for the people that participated. So thank you one and all. Chuck your clapping emojis up there. Do do all that good stuff. Um, yes, and I might call this meeting to a close. Thank you.